I'm, I'm Peter Howerstein, AIA Tampa Bay president. I want to welcome you to our March membership meeting, a lecture by Mario Gooden, titled Black and Tan, the Wooden Museum. So thank you so much to Mario Gooden for agreeing to make the presentation today um, and to want to make a gents new work with Mr. Gooden to help arrange the program. This is a, a special event for us. Um, but before we get started, we have a little bit of chapter business to, to go over. Um, first and foremost, our uh, registration is now open for our annual golf tournament. It will be on Monday, May 24th at the Carrollwood Country Golf Club. And you can find the information about that on our website. And also coming up is the Tampa Bay Design Week. That's April 5th to 10th. Um, they're going to be daily events, including a collection of several, ready for this, everybody, live and some virtual programs to enjoy. So that schedule is gonna be released next week. So look for it. It'll be nice to actually have some events in person um, and Tampa Bay Design is gonna help us do that. Um, we're also inviting members to get involved in our committee this year. We have a great bunch of uh, folks already running and helping to uh, make our committees successful. But uh, I know that there's a, a lot of things out there that interest folks that we're talking to right now. So please reach out to our staff, Don and Ellie are happy to guide you and find you something that you're passionate about so you can help help in things that you like doing and, and help the community at the same time. And last but not least, we wanna just thank our Keystone partners. This is our first um, event of the year. Uh, these are firms and companies that support our, that they support us throughout the year. So I'd like to say thanks to ASE, to Lima Construction, to New Age Reaper Graphics, Sesco Lighting, Snell Engineering, TLC, and Walter Pumore. Um, your support is greatly appreciated. And from there, I'm just going to turn this over to, to Lindsay so she can introduce Mr. Gooden and moderate the program. Thank you, Peter. My name is Lindsay Evans. I'm the membership chair for the AIA Tampa Bay. I think you'll find Mario's presentation enlightening, inspiring. Uh, as Peter said, the title of the lecture is Black and Tan, the Woodson Museum. A little bit about Mario. Mario Gooden is a cultural practice architect and founding principal of Huff Gooden Architects. His practice engages the cultural landscape and the intersectionality of architecture, race, gender, sexuality, and technology. His work crosses the threshold between the design of architecture and the built environment, writing, um, research, and performance. Gooden is also a professor of practice at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation of Columbia University, where he's co-director of the Global Africa Lab. He is a 2012 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow, a McDowell uh, Fellow, the 2019 National Academy of the Arts and the Letters Award and Architecture recipient. Gooden is the author of Dark Space, Architecture Representation, Black Identity, as well as numerous essays and articles on architecture, art, and cultural production. Gooden is a research associate at the Visual Identities in Art and Design at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. And I will turn it over to Mario. Um, as we go through the lecture, please uh, put all your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Um, and I'll help kind of filter through those questions and read those off to Mario. Um, but thank you for being here today. And please do keep your microphones muted so we can all hear Mario. Over to you, Mario. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> okay. thank you very much. Uh, Lindsay, it's really a pleasure to be here virtually with you this, this evening. Um, and also thank you to Peter for the warm welcome. Um, thank you to Don and also to Ellie for the technical, uh, technical support um, this evening. Uh, this presentation will be uh, perhaps a little bit different than usual. Um, as uh, Lindsay mentioned, uh, my work crosses several thresholds. So the presentation tonight will do some of the same in terms of uh, being a multimedia transdisciplinary uh, presentation that will weave in and construct, if you will, a constellation of ideas uh, leading up to an exposition 
about the Woodson Museum. Um, so without further delay, let's get started here. I will share my screen and we can see if we can kick this off and get things going. Okay, hopefully everyone is seeing that. Yes, put that piano stool back where it's on there. Take that dust and put it over there. 
1982, interview with Michel Foucault, Space, Power, and Knowledge. So architects are not necessarily the masters of space that they once were or believe themselves to be. Foucault, that's right. They are not the technicians or engineers of the three great variables, territory, communication, and speed. These escape the domain of architects. Do you see any particular architectural projects either in the past or the present as forces of liberation or resistance? Foucault, I do not believe that it is possible to say that one thing is of the order of liberation and another is of the order of oppression. There are a certain number of things that one can say with some certainty about a concentration camp to the effect that it is not an instrument of liberation, but one should still take into account that it is not generally acknowledged that aside from torture and execution which preclude any resistance no matter how terrifying a given system may be, there always remains the possibility of resistance, disobedience, and oppositional grouping. On the other hand, I do not think that there is anything that is functionally, by its very nature, absolutely liberating. Liberty is a practice. So there may, in fact, always be a certain number of projects whose aim is to modify some constraints, to loosen, or even to break them. But none of these projects can say simply by its nature, assume that people will have liberty automatically. That is, that it is something to be established by the project itself. Not because they are ambiguous, but simply because liberty is what must be exercised. Space and time. An event is something that happens at a particular point in space and at a particular time. So one can specify it by four numbers or coordinates. The choice of coordinates is arbitrary. One can use any three well-defined spatial coordinates in any measure of time. In relativity, there is no real distinction between the space and time coordinates, just as there is no real distinction between any two space coordinates. It is often helpful to think of the four coordinates of an event as specifying its position in a four-dimensional space called space-time. The mass of the sun curves space-time in such a way that although the Earth follows a straight path in four-dimensional space-time, it appears to us to move along a circular orbit in three-dimensional space-time. Black holes ain't so black. A black hole is a set of events from which it is not possible to escape to a large distance. The boundary of the black hole, the event horizon, is formed by the light rays that just failed to escape from the black hole, hovering forever just on the edge. 
It's a bit like running away from the police and just managing to keep one step ahead, but not being able to get clear away. They say our people were born on water. When it occurred, no one can say for certain. Perhaps it was the second week or the third week, but surely by the fourth, when they had not seen their land for so many, many days, they lost count. It was after fear had turned into despair and despair into resignation and resignation into an abiding understanding. Whose earth is it anyway? If we save the planet and have a society of inequality, we wouldn't have saved much. Audre Lord says, Accord the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They are too narrow and thus assume that people of color have nothing to say about race, gender, sexuality, and the earth, all of which are interconnected. Sakima Jenkins and company is compelled to present the most astounding and important painting show of the fall art show viewing season. Collectors of fine art will flock to see the latest Carol Walker offering. And what is she offering? But the finest selection of artworks by an African-American living woman artist this side of the Mississippi. Modest collectors will find her prices reasonable. Those of a heartier disposition will recognize bargains. Scholars will study and debate the historical value and intellectual merit of Ms. Walker's diversionary tactics. Art historians will wonder whether the work represents a, represents a departure or a continuum. Students of color will eye her work suspiciously and exercise their free right to culturally annihilate her on social media. Parents will cover the eyes of innocent school children. School teachers will re-examine their art history curricula. Prestigious art academies and academic societies will withdraw their support. Former husbands and former lovers will recoil in abject terror. Critics will shake their heads in bemused silence. Gallery directors will wring their hands at the sight of the throngs of the gallery curious flooding the pavement outside. The final president of the United States will visibly wince. Empires will fall, although which ones only time will tell. No place for self-pity, no room for fear by Toni Morrison. Christmas, the day after in 2004, following the presidential re-election of George W. Bush. I'm staring out of the window in an extremely dark mood, feeling helpless. Then a friend, a fellow artist, calls me to ask, how are you, and to wish me happy holidays. And instead of saying, fine, how are you, I blurt out the truth. Not well, not only am I depressed, I can't seem to write. It's as though I am paralyzed, unable to write anything more in this novel I've begun. I've never felt this way before, but the election, I'm, and I'm about to explain, when he interrupts shouting, no, 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 this is precisely the time when artists go to work, not when everything is fine, but in times of dread, that is our job. I was foolish and I felt foolish for the rest of the morning, especially when I call, recall the artists who had done their work in gulags, prison cells, hospital beds, who did their work while hounded, exiled, reviled, pilloried, and those who were executed. But I remember my friend saying on that day, none of this bodes well for the future, but this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language, we do architecture. This is how civilizations heal. I know the world is bruising and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. <laughs> Chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art.
On a hot summer day in 1952, 17-year-old Mamie Livingston and two younger sisters walked the 10 blocks from their East Baltimore home to Clifton Park Municipal Swimming Pool. The three had never been to the pool before, even though they grew up so very near to it. Mamie did not expect to either that day, but she hoped. A rather rude attendant turned the girls away with scorn, according to Mamie, but added that the city would soon build a pool nearby that they could swim in. Mamie waited eagerly out the summer of her senior year at Carver High, but saw no evidence of the senior of the, of the pool. She then wrote to the Baltimore's leading African-American newspaper, asking what had happened to the pool. Mamie said, if this country is ever to have equal rights, why not start here? For her, equal rights was not an abstract principle. It meant having a pool to swim in, just like her white neighbors. Unspoken spaces, inside and outside the boundaries of class, race, and space. Amistad Opera in two acts, music by Anthony Davis, libretto by Thelani Davis. Act one, scene one, the unknown is my realm. Scene two, cloth for the dead. Scene three, savages of legend. Scene four, ankle and wrist. Scene five, the greatest liberty. Act two, scene one, posers, dandies, and hacks. Scene two, what the navigator saw. Scene three, president's parlor of foreign appeal. Scene four, what Antonio saw. Scene five, they saw a god. Scene six, skin of clouds. Scene seven, freed by lord and chief. Scene eight, the rising. Scene nine, bird on a wing. Memphis Press Scimitar published this account. 10 a.m. at Brooks Memorial Art Gallery, Overton Park, where Thursday is Negro Day, and usually, according to directors, very few take advantage of it. Four boys and three girls entered, asked to see the Mid-South Art Exhibit, were directed to the basement where it is, and were standing there examining the exhibits when police arrived and suggested that they leave. These all stood mute were taken to jail. Six others standing outside the gallery were also taken to jail. Although de facto segregation is known to have occurred in St. Petersburg as early as the end of the 19th century, the first attempt at de jure, at de jure segregation took place during the 1913 election for city commissioner in the form of an all white primary, which was widely used throughout much of the South at the time. To ensure that only candidates with a strong white following would appear on the final ballot, the purpose of the all white primary was to prevent African Americans from voting during the primary election, thereby automatically eliminating candidates with a strong black following. 22nd Avenue in South, 22nd Avenue South in St. Petersburg is better known as the Deuces, a historic part of the city that kept a 1960s African American community together. The historic Manhattan Casino is a land, landmark. 
The 1920s building was known for dances featuring big names in jazz and blues, including Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Ray Charles, James Brown, Nat King Cole, and more. It functioned as a community center and cultural center entertainment uh, in St. Petersburg for more than 40 years. In 1962, one could step out of, the, out of the door, cross the street, and get a shoe shine at Cozy Inn, have lunch at the Shag, and later get a haircut at Oscar Kleckie's. You could visit your attorney and buy groceries at Barco's store. Dr. Eyre could examine you. If, that was, if it was too late for that, funeral arrangements could be, made, could be made at the Arch Royal. However, in time, the area lost its spark. You can ask someone like Gloria Campbell, who has kept her business on the 22nd Street corridor for the past two decades about the change. Segregation and the interstate basically killed this area, she said. The Woodson, Black Resilience. Architecture is a mode of cultural production not dissimilar to art, dance, music, and film. Art and cultural work allows us to see the everyday conditions of society in a new way, illuminating critical work and cultural work that is a representation as well as production. While different forms of music and their direct corporal corporeal relationships are perhaps the most readily understood modes of cultural production, jazz is the only mode of cultural expression, is not only a mode of cultural expression, but a representation of the African-American experience, with its roots extending before blues music, even to even Negro spirituals and gospel music, jazz, also known as America's classical music, as well as America's indigenous art form, having its birth and evolution in the United States, chronicles Black Americans' relationship with the ideals of America and the idea of Black ontology. Renowned Harlem Renaissance writer Ralph Ellison defines the jazz impulse as a constant process of redefinition. The jazz artist constantly reworks her identity on three levels. One, as an individual. Two, as a member of a community. Three, as a link in the chain of tradition. From a contextual point of view, the design seeks to stitch back the community that was once existed in the urban, urban realm before the severing of 22nd Street South by the interstate. The design includes artwork and the Black Lives Matter mural that connects, welcomes, and extends not only the museum and the local community, but also to the city, the region, and beyond. In the 1929 short film entitled Black and Tan, based on Duke Ellington's Black and Tan fantasy, Director Dudley Murray explores the space of Black ontology, moving from neorealism of the early motion pictures and the avant-garde of, of European experimentation of space and time, and finally to the er, er, otherworldly chiaroscuro representation of existential Blackness. The main sequences of the film explore migratory movements of Black bodies under constant redefinition, the performance of Black identity, 
and its reflexive relationships with American society, and finally, the transcendence of Black identity beyond the limiting conditions of circumstances and history. Design strategies. From this analysis, a programmatic strategy of appropriation and improvisation, Black spatial liberation is a praxis of appropriation and improvisation. The building lifts up at the street level to accommodate improvisational programs and events such as outdoor performances or jazz quartets. This is a welcoming gesture that allows visitors access to the museum without the discomfort of historic exclusion. The gift shop and justice center, a flexible space for educational programming and justice work are both accessible during the after hours when the museum is closed. Black identity confronts the gaze of authority. So black identity is not dependent upon the construction of an image rooted in the European conception and the perception of space, but rather black identity is based upon a way of knowing and being in the world that is informed by opposition, resistance and temporality, as well as by participatory creation, abstraction and multivalency. The black spatial condition collapses subject and object relationships through spatial inversions dissolves hierarchies through subverting the gaze and challenging colonial knowledge and systems through multiplicities rather than singularities. The peeling away from the ground and lifting of the building creates multiple vantage points for observation on the site, through the site and back towards the urban corridor. Additionally, this provides a shaded and protected space at the exterior underneath as well as at the west elevation with its large overhang and oar-like louvers that allude to a vessel or ship ready to take off or elude constraint. The sculpture garden includes a feature called the water table that is a very shallow fountain of wet black stone that when dry also serves as a stage for outdoor performances. At the interior of the ground floor lobby, multiple vantage points reconnect interior to exterior and programs and spaces are juxtaposed into a spatial collage of events, activities and energy. From the arrival at a service point to the orientation area, to the gift shop, to the west stramp, there can also, that can also be used for small gatherings and then to the exterior sculpture garden. The design not only creates unique juxtapositions, but it also challenges points of view, architectural ideologies about representation and subjectivities. And it unbinds space in a way that frees program from static conditions to form the liberatory conditions of flow.
As Freddie Washington's body slices through space and carves embodied movement that is simultaneously exuberant and exhaustive, this recalls Toni Morrison's writing in Race Matters from the source of self-regard. My effort to manipulate Eng American English was not to take standard English and use vernacular to decorate it or paint over it, but to carve away at its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but were inevitable. If we substitute architecture for American English, then my effort to manipulate architecture was not to take standard architecture and use vernacular to decorate it or to paint over it, but to carve away at its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence, so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but were inevitable. At the second level of the museum, one finds the exhibition spaces, three galleries which are interlinked and can be used for major exhibitions or is used as two galleries or for the museum's future permanent collection and a large gallery for temporary exhibitions. An ambulatory space completes a circuit up and along the east stramp and down and along the west stramp that pauses at a loggia that can function for smaller events, as well as an observatory that casts an eye of the museum beyond the highway and reconnects to the, to the regenerative community known as the Deuces Rising. Finally, the Requiem scene from Black and Tan, Dark Shadows and Experiential Strategy translates in terms of the spatial experience in the galleries. While light illuminates the formal properties of objects and spaces, shadow and the spatiality of darkness reveals the presence of, the, of space and the body in space. As bodies and objects merge in shadow and darkness new spatial conditions emerge to challenge the relationships between vision and experience. The body casts a shadow and presents an other way of knowing and experience. The experience of, of space in shadow and darkness is visceral, material, and tactile. 
thereby offering the possibility of transcending normative power structures towards a spatial and experiential liberation. This condition will be evident at night as lighting from the gallery emanates through the skylight and as shadows cast from the interior to the exterior on its ground surfaces merges bodies and landscapes and activities on the site. In the 1982 interview with Michel Foucault, Foucault says that liberty is a practice. Yet, in the American colonies, this coincided with the racialization of space enacted through slave codes restricting the movements and gatherings of enslaved Africans. Laws were passed that overtly distinguished black people from white people. Foucault states that it is not possible to say that a thing is either of the order of liberation or oppression, but rather concedes that architectural projects are complicit in the reshaping of the public sphere as simultaneous forces of liberation and, and resistance. The problem of space, he emphasized, is that liberty is a practice. Reflexively, as an act of self-emancipation for Black people, liberation is a spatial practice. This turn on Foucault's axiom points out how liberation is an act necessitated by the oppressive forces of political institutions, infrastructures, and crucially, their resultant spaces. Black people have thus made liberation a spatial practice throughout their existence in America. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, we have Jason Jensen on as well. So I'll open it up to you both uh, for a discussion. Hey, Jason, where are you? Hey, Mario. Thank you for giving the presentation with the much appreciated. Right. So let's see, are we taking questions? Yeah, yeah, I don't have any questions yet. So if anybody has any questions, if you want to uh, go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, we can have Mario uh, answer those and Jason as well on the museum or anything pertaining to Mario's work. I don't know, Jason, maybe we should just start talking about something. <laughs> that is the fallback, I suppose. <laughs> It, you you answered everything eloquently, I, I guess. Yeah. Jason, do you want to talk a little bit? Um, I don't know if everybody is familiar kind of with the site of the New Woodson Museum. Um, kind of in the full history maybe of that neighborhood and what uh, challenges you guys faced with with that? Well, I, I think when we originally went after this project, you know, as an interview, 
it, we didn't show a solution. We showed our, our, our process of investigating the site and the history of the site. And this site is so you know, embedded with the, the issues that we're, we're trying to illuminate with this museum. Uh, we've, we found multiple church lo locations that were displaced by the interstate at this location, the, the grid that was uh, bifurcated by the interstate. I mean, it really happens at a point that illustrates the uh, kind of systematic or you know, approach to the, the black neighborhood here. And this museum is, is placed right on the, the edge of that. So originally, you know, this, uh, the Deuces Rising 22nd Street was the, the heart of the black community. It was the, the place where all of the businesses came together, the Manhattan Casino across the street, such an integral part culturally. And yeah, this site illuminates all of that. You know, so we started from a point of discovery and looking to the past to begin to assimilate this. And, and the museum you know, reflects that even with the, the, lifting, the lifting up, it's, also, it's inviting, but it's also illuminating that the interstate was lifted up and creating a scar within the community. So it's all reflective of the past, you know, but look, looking forward to the future. Yeah, and I think we also, you know, desire, um, you know, in, you know, figurative, if not really in, in literal terms, to extend the proposed uh, redevelopment of the, of the streetscape south of the highway that's called the, the Deuces Rising, to actually extend that north uh, beyond, the, the, beyond the interstate. At, at the moment, the interstate still provides a kind of boundary, if you will, or barrier. Uh, to the uh, to the community and to the and to the public realm. So our intent with the with the design is to uh, invite, but also to to stitch back um, through the uh, through the street mural, through artwork, through other streetscaping, if you will, to to reconnect and and pull the deuces rising north, if you will. The redevelopment of the Manhattan Casino a few years ago. That was, you know, the first, you know, important step. Uh, the museum is another, you know, really, really important step to, to the reclamation, if you will, of, you know, of that as a public space, of 22nd Street South as a public space. Yeah, if, if you look at the old pictures of 22nd Street, I mean, you could have mistaken it for any place in Harlem of the same era is extremely dense, extremely well used, uh, a great urban edge at the time. And I mean, we're, we're trying to stitch back together, but it is an ex a physical barrier that we're trying to stitch across. You know, so the, the view across the top of it, the, the way of programming and artistically connecting below it, we're doing everything we can co to connect but the physical barrier really does illustrate the the, the past and, and what we're we're dealing with. Um, you also have the warehouse arts dis district that's coming into play, you know, to the the north of this site that it will tie into as well. Uh, in the big picture of St. Petersburg, you know, this will be a a new nexus of energy for the arts, uh, tying in with some of the other arts district, uh, you know, programs and the uh, clay uh, uh, occupancy as well. So there are some other factors that we're tying into, but you know, it, it still is a realization that this is a, a tremendous scar that we're you know connecting to and trying to connect across. Okay, I'll, I'll thank you, Jason. I'll go to one of the questions. It looks like Sarah Lyons put in, uh, loved the themes of rhythm, space, time, and the participatory aspect of architecture reflected. Can you talk about this in the experience of visitors, but maybe also for the users and potential 
future creators or is it really just a reflection of the past? Um, no, it's actually not a reflection of the past at all, but it's about what I would call um, uh, futurity, if you will. Um, so the museum imagines, you know, what if the interstate had not been constructed uh, in that location? Um, and so the, the lifting is not really about the past. The lifting of the building isn't about the past. The lifting of the building is about the future and it invites uh, users, it invites visitors to actually come to the museum um, and to inhabit that space, inhabit the outdoor space without having to actually purchase a ticket. So one can, you know, because we know that these have been, were historically spaces of exclusion um, like the, uh, the uh, example that I gave of the Brooks uh, Art Gallery, now the Brooks Museum in, uh, in Tennessee, where you know, students were arrested for, you know, for wanting to see art, uh, arrested and taken to jail. The ones on the exterior were taken to jail for loitering. So the, the museum you know, as a typology has been a space of exclusion. So we're not looking to the past, we're very much looking to the future and thinking what is a, if you will, an African-American museum of the future that opens its doors, that opens its site, that allows someone to participate without necessarily having to confront the historic barriers of, of exclusion. Um, we also have uh, several programs at that ground level a justice center, which is a multiple, uh, a uh, multiple functional, multifunctional space, an education space that can be used for the museum's education uh, programming, as well as a space for uh, for social justice work that can be opened when the museum is not closed. So it can be open after hours. It can be open on Sunday afternoons. Similar to the the gift shop, which is more than just um, uh, a place to buy souvenirs, but we see this as a, a also a kind of space for cultural uh, education, if you will, that people can stop and purchase, you know, books, purchase information, what have you, when the museum is closed. And then, as I mentioned, the possibility of having exterior events beneath, at the exterior beneath the loggia or even in the sculpture garden when the museum is closed so that this becomes uh, again, a welcoming space, and it's really about a kind of Afro futurity, if you will, but, but I would say not at all about the past, even though it is looking towards, uh, looking towards the South. Okay, great. So we'll go to Carlos's question. Uh, can you talk a little bit how some of the new protocols with social distancing will affect the design of great of public gathering spaces and spaces like museums that depend on socialization? It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks, Carlos, for, for, that, yeah, for that question. Um, you know, in, in this design, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, not explicitly uh, responded, if you will, to the, uh, to the current situation, but we have given ample space on the site, for example, the sculpture garden as a place for exterior gathering that can be uh, used, you know, at times free of charge. At other times, there may be unique events that may happen there. Spaces, as I was just describing, at the exterior along the street that can be used so that uh, visitors uh, can be, if you will, deconcentrated, you know, on the site. Uh, there are also various locations in the building, uh, at the second floor loggia on the West Stramp, which is uh, uh, designed as a kind of uh, theater seating, if you will, as well as uh, a space which I did not mention, uh, but there was a rendering of it, which is a which is called a forum, which is a uh, a major event space that seats up to 500 people that can be used for receptions, business receptions, family reunions, weddings, and that actually opens directly to the exterior. So it's a space 
that's both inside and outside and can allow for, you know, for physical distancing if, if necessary. You know, but hopefully um, uh, when this is built, we will be beyond this current uh, pandemic and we'll have learned something uh, that might help us uh, when the inevitable next pandemic happens. Thank you, Mario. Uh, next Thank you. question from Chad Jones. Does the museum accentuate any particular type of artwork? Um, the museum uh, uh, is still building its, its collection. Um, it does not have a, uh, a large permanent collection at the moment. The works that we included in the gallery renderings that you saw are all works by the artist David Hammonds with the exception of one piece, which is uh, by the uh, artist Romare Bearden. Uh, but we included those representations to give a sense of scale of the museum, but also um, to, uh, the ethos of the museum for the kinds of works, let's say in relationship to a traveling exhibit or to a temporary exhibit that the museum desires to, uh, to attract. I, I, I would also just add that artists we have a lot of spaces that are conducive for music performance uh, you know very, very you know current work and uh, allow for that interaction I, I think that's very different than a lot of other museums that are very static on what they're offering uh, we with the amount of outdoor space a lot of outdoor performance space we're inviting that action that interaction to occur, and I think that's unique to this museum. Yes, and you know, although you know, this is a museum for you know for all of St. Petersburg, for all of the uh, you know Tampa Bay region, um, you know, as an African American museum, and you know, with an eye towards African American cultural production, um, you know, current or contemporary uh, art practices by, uh, by black artists are, you know, are transdisciplinary. Um, a number of, of artists, you know, very good friends of mine are not only working in painting or sculpture, but are also working in film as, as well as, as performance. So as Jason says, we have designed uh, a variety of spaces that I think can accommodate Know, transdisciplinary practice, transdisciplinary art practices, and and art making. All right, we are running out of time, so I'm going to read one last question. We have a good question from Mary Alvarez. Uh, fascinating process. As designers and architects, we often have an appreciation for different cultures, backgrounds, and subjects. As we become more aware of the importance of representation, how do you avoid falling into cultural appropriation? Where do we draw the line from appreciation to appropriation in architecture? Um, yes, yeah, Mary, really thanks for, um, for that uh, question. And um, uh, I actually kind of baked my response to, the, to that question because I've been thinking about that question a lot and I've kind of baked it into the, to the presentation and I'll just return to Toni Morrison, that quote from Toni Morrison uh, from uh, The Source of Self-Regard where, uh, where Toni Morrison wrote that um, uh, her effort to manipulate American English uh, was not to take standard English and use the vernacular to decorate it. So, you know, if we, you know, as an architect, we would say um, my effort to manipulate architecture is not to take architecture and decorate it with necessarily with cultural symbols or, you know, in the case of designing African American museums to decorate it with, you know, uh, African, let's say textures or colors, if you will. Um, Morrison goes on to say that you know, her effort to manipulate the language is to carve away at its secretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, 
paraly and paralysis, one might say, I suppose, to create a, uh, an anti-colonial architecture, if you will, um, and to actually open up. For me, that notion of carving is about opening up the possibilities of architecture in terms of representation rather than shutting down the possibilities of architecture by, uh, let's say, narrow, narrowly defining architecture through certain symbols or what have you. I, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Mir. All right. Uh, do we have time for one more, Mario? Sure. OK. <laughs> um, let's see. Please share what inspired your material selection. Was there any particular significance that ties the past to future hopes? Um, in terms of material selections, I think the first uh, material that we were thinking about, um, and uh, this is also related to uh, a bit of writing from Ralph um, Ellison describing the artwork of Romare Bearden, where he writes that Rom Romare Bearden was examining the plasticity, if you will, of, of space and movement and of the African American experience. So, so uh, for us, that translated into thinking about the plasticity of architecture. So, the, you know, we designed it, if you will, as a kind of shell that ramps from the ground, then up and over sort of creating a shell or creating a vessel, if you will, that then there were these three major volumes which are uh, supported or hung. And actually tectonically, they're literally hung uh, from the roof structure in that, uh, uh, within that shell. So we were thinking about the, let's say, plasticity of space, uh, concrete, you know, as a material, as a plastic material in terms of, uh, not only plasticity, but also in terms of thinking about flow um, and, the, and this kind of movement of space, a kind of continuous movement. And, uh, but yes, there are certain other materials that, you know, the use of wood, you know, more familiar, you know, everyday materials that one would rub one's hand on and over a time, you know, begin to develop a certain kind of patina or what have you in terms of know, of touch and in terms of warmth and, and those things. Um, and then of course we will, you know, we'll be using, you know, the, you know, the latest technology in terms of glazing and, uh, and what have you. But, um, you know, this was not an attempt necessarily to make a futuristic uh, or something that looks futuristic uh, because we know that, you know, the thing that looks futuristic already becomes dated before um, you know, before the future, but actually to design an architecture that I would say that's not uh, timely, but timeless. Great. Thank you, Mario. Uh, thank you, Jason, for helping answer questions. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to give us this lecture tonight. It's really special to us as part of the AIA for Tampa Bay. Um, and thank you all of our members for tuning in and asking these great questions. I think that's all we have time for tonight. Um, but thank you, Mario. Okay, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mario. Good to see you. Thank you.